to the new Cyber Frontier, bringing you the latest news on the local Colorado economy and initiatives that focus on the development of cybersecurity economics. You don't have to be a computer or cybersecurity expert to get plugged in. Your host, Chris Gorog, brings it straightforward, asks the tough questions, and brings the cyber world to a level of understanding for everyone. Chris is personable and opens up with our guests on issues we all would like to see addressed. You can find us on the web at www.newcyberfrontier.com. Now join our host as he introduces the topic for today's New Cyber Frontier. Welcome to today's episode of the New Cyber Frontier podcast. Today, I have a guest on with me, Michael Willis, who is the Assistant Adjutant General for Cyberspace and Missile Defense for the Colorado State National Guard. Welcome today, Michael, how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for having me on your program. Yeah, I hope I got everything right with your title. That was a definitely a <laughs> mouthful there. It is a mouthful, but you nailed it. That was good. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about uh, the local cyber effort, but mostly about you know, how the National Guard fits in and what sure. their cyber effort does down, down there. But first of all, Michael, give us a background on yourself. Tell us about what makes you tick and how you got into doing this type of work. Hey, right. You know, that's a hard thing to describe. I don't know, but I'm a Colorado native. I uh, grew up here, went to uh, went to University of Colorado. So sorry, all you Rams fans. Uh, and I was commissioned out of University of Colorado into the Army as a second lieutenant. I spent 10 years on active duty. Uh, and then after that, uh, my family and I decided that we wanted to come back to Colorado and uh, had an opportunity to become a... Uh, Colorado National Guardsman, which I've been since 1999. And I think that's kind of shortly after I became a Guardsman, I started uh, uh, being assigned to jobs that, that became more and more technical. I, I was one of the first Army space support team leaders working out of Peterson Air Force Base. And, and uh, that started taking me down a path uh, that led to the uh, Strategic Missile Defense Brigade that's part of the Colorado National Guard. Uh, and over time, I've gotten more and more comfortable with, with technology, and uh, somewhere in there, Colorado National Guard built a uh, cyber defensive operations team. And I kind of went around and did some other things uh, in the Guard, and then when uh, this opportunity came up, General Edwards asked me, he said, you're the mo most technical senior guy I got, and I said, oh boy, we might be in trouble then. <laughs> and uh, But he asked me to do this, I'm really excited to have this, this job. And, he asked me how I got here, and I couldn't describe that. And I certainly wouldn't uh, advise anyone to attempt my career path because I have no idea why it worked. But I hear uh, you. it's been great. The Colorado Guard's been great. I know that random progression of things and how that goes. My life spent a lot of those years doing that itself. So, what is it that that Colorado National Guard? What's your mission there? What's your main purpose? Well, the National Guard uh, is really has twofold purposes. We have a federal mission. Uh, and, and people are very, very cognizant of our federal mission. Uh, post 9-11, the National Guard's been decisively engaged overseas, and I think everyone has a really good feel for that. We also have a state mission, uh, which frankly is just as important, and we've been just as busy uh, uh, supporting our neighbors here in Colorado. Mm -hmm. uh, people are familiar, I think, with some of the things we do. We respond to floods, 2013 floods. We respond to fires like Waldo Canyon, Black Forest fires. Uh, we respond to uh, blizzards. Uh, those are kind of the, the big things we do. And now, uh, more recently, as we've built this cyber defense capability, we're now in a position to respond to a cyber event in the state of Colorado, uh, okay. much in the same way that we would a fire or a flood. So now, a little bit more specific, the cyber purpose, the cyber mission. Explain that. Right, sure. You know, right now, Colorado has a uh, uh, defensive cyber operations team. It, it really, its primary mission is to provide the governor a response asset to a cyber event, uh, whether it's a, a, a failure kind of event or a threat an adversarial kind of event to defend the state's critical infrastructure. We're really talking public utilities like power, like water, sewage. Uh, and should the event overwhelm uh, the state's or local municipalities' capability, 
we have it, this team that uh, that we can provide to the governor uh, to defeat uh, to defeat that threat and and help those assets, those critical infrastructure assets, recover and get back online to mm-hmm. provide services to Coloradans. We'll be right back with the rest of today's show right after these brief messages from our sponsors. Cyber Resilience Institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack. Like building a neighborhood watch, it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world. Typically, we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets, but don't know where to begin. Let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.org. So critical infrastructure, now I, I heard, and this was just kind of floored me, that they went and had a political effort to define what critical infrastructure was. And the list came up with all these public buildings where a lot of people are at on higher than the, the digital assets that we would consider in utilities. Now, yeah. I'm not sure if, if that's changed or whatever, but, or if that's even true. Maybe I heard it through a third party. But the defining of critical infrastructure and what we spend our priority on, how is that done? And what's your opinion on that, that what I've heard about that list? There have been some efforts to define what critical infrastructure is, and frankly, I, and I think appropriately, it hasn't been narrowed down too much. I, I think that would be a mistake to narrow it down too too much. So it does include things as broad as the utilities, but also hospitals, right? Hospital systems could be critical infrastructure. Uh, certainly, Coloradans would be at risk if if something were to create a a uh, a cyber threat to our hospitals or healthcare system. It, you mentioned, you know, buildings, high occupancy buildings. Mm, that gets a little fuzzy, but at the end of the day, uh, quite honestly, that political decision, if the governor were to decide that that the, the safety, the health, the welfare of Coloradans was at risk, he could deem that a, a critical infrastructure and ask the guard to assist in recovery for that. Mm-hmm. So, and I think that's appropriate. Uh, the governor is charged with the the protection of the citizens of Colorado, and we shouldn't we shouldn't uh, cage him with some definition. Uh, a non cyber example was after the floods in 2013. The governor decided that the economic necessity of rebuilding Highway 36 was critical to the state. And so he asked a guard to help rebuild that. He certainly would have the same authority in a cyber incident. Um, So it could be very diverse as to what your mission is even, it sounds like. It could be. It it absolutely could be. And I think, you know, guardsmen are comfortable with that. We're used to that kind of ambiguity. Okay. Uh, We're a tool for the governor. And if he, if he sees fit to use us, then that's okay. Okay. So now this local effort in Colorado, the governor has said we want to make the state of Colorado the cyber capital of the world, and we're going to put that in Colorado Springs. What have you been involved with from the Guard point of view in this er- this effort? Yeah, it's a great effort. I think uh, that the, I think the governor is on to here. Uh, most of that effort is being led by the the board of directors that they put together. And we don't have a seat on the board of directors, but we have stayed – uh, in pretty close contact with uh, particularly Lieutenant General Retired Anderson. Uh, and we've had several opportunities to speak with him and, so, uh, and some of the other board members about the direction they're going in the world the National Guard may uh, play mm-hmm. in direction. Uh, we, you know, it, the Guard, I think, views this as a, as a great opportunity to continue partnering with members of the of the community, mm-hmm. uh, and so we're pretty excited uh, about what they're doing. And appreciate the opportunity to, to kind of work with them on shaping how we interact with them as they build this uh, this center. Yeah. So, and I don't want you to divulge any information that might 
be sensitive, but can you talk about some of the efforts you're involved in and things you're working on? Sure. Uh, I don't think anything's particularly sensitive about their efforts. Um, we went down, uh, I don't know, maybe three weeks ago uh, and toured the TRW building, the old TRW building that, that they are looking at remodeling. Mm -hmm. And we're going to revisit that again to see if it's appropriate uh, and full for our station, a piece of our cyber defense forces in the building, co-locate them with that center. So that's a discussion. That's not a decision. Uh, but uh, I think that's an example of some of the things we we are considering in this partnership is we may we may actually physically co-locate with them. Okay. Um, some of the other things that, that kind of come up in broad brush topics is our uh, cyber mission includes the ability to to uh, advise and assist and to train. One of their three legs is to provide training for local uh, municipalities and for state governments. Uh, and we would explore the opportunity for the Colorado National Guard to, to train local authorities, other state governments on what their National Guard, you know, if you're in Michigan or whatever state, mm -hmm. you know, what your National Guard may be able to bring to you, or if you're the uh, county commissioner of a Colorado county. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, here's something that you may want to participate in our exercises just to test your responses, and we can we can provide feedback. So those are things we'd like to explore working through with the center. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, training for other, you said other government officials in other states or military, other states, uh, National Guards, things like that. So you're looking at putting those training exercises together for them. Uh, at least participating in, in, in the design of an exercise. Okay. Uh, we kind of do that now. Well, we don't kind of, we definitely do that now, working with the uh, Office of Information Technology and the Colorado Information Analysis Center in coordination with Regis University. We've mm -hmm. now run for three years an exercise program where we not only test our own response capabilities, but we invite uh, public utilities and other public companies to come and test their responses. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we could continue to expand through the, the governor's initiative for the center. Yeah, there's, there's supposed to be a lot of integration, public-private partnerships with, with uh, companies and industry and everything. What right. type of outreach and things like that do you have going with private industry throughout the, the state? I think we've just now... Uh, begun to have some success in the private part of the of the public-private partnerships. Uh, this upcoming August, this exercise we have in August, I think is really the first one we can hang our hat on and say we had a public company, public utilities, in this case, really participate mm -hmm. in an exercise. Um, we're also doing, I think you're aware of our participation in a, uh, a sports uh, ISAO. Mm -hmm. and that's another, I think, success story uh, where we've begun to work with private companies um, and, and expand our footprint more than we have in probably the last three or four years. We've been working with academia, as I said, with Regis University. Mm -hmm. But I'm pretty excited about these upcoming events uh, where we are going to work specifically with a, uh, a private company. Yeah. So, and we had talked about, you know, my initial thought with the three legs of the NCIC, or I think they're changing the name of it here. I yeah. I haven't heard an official <laughs> name yet. Um, <laughs> that there's a response portion. And I thought, wow, Colorado National Guard is big in the response. But there's some limitations there. Um, tell us about what's, what you can be involved with there and what are the limitations, because that was really interesting to me. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's important, I think, for people to understand what the Guard can and cannot do statutorily. Mm -hmm. um, like all our response forces in the cyber uh, response, we're, we're uh, confined to what the governor declares a, as an emergency. And so a company can't just call the National Guard and say, hey, I think I have a cyber event. Can you come help me out? We'll be right back with the rest of today's show right after these brief messages from our sponsors. 
Cyber Resilience Institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack. Like building a neighborhood watch, it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world. Typically, we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets, but don't know where to begin. Let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.org. It's important, I think, for people to understand what the Guard can and cannot do statutorily. Mm -hmm. um, like all our response forces in the cyber uh, response, we're, we're uh, confined to what the governor declares a, as an emergency. And so a company can't just call the National Guard and say, hey, I think I have a cyber event. Can you come help me out? You really can't do that. Um, however, we are an asset available to the governor if a cyber event were to exceed, you know, a, a local municipality or local government's capability to respond, uh, or if the governor were to determine that, you know, some something he defined as a critical asset were being overwhelmed, the governor can declare an emergency and then uh, direct the guard to respond to that. That's very collaborative effort. You know, there's dialogue that goes back and forth between the affected municipality or the affected uh, utilities and the governor's office. But for us to uh, put our uh, team uh, on duty and send them to respond requires uh, uh, a declaration of an emergency, and, and the governor has to direct us to do that. Uh, and that's an important thing. To understand that you just can't pick up a red phone and call the, the cyber, uh, the National Guard Cyber Response Force. It's, it's a little more complicated than that. Interesting. Yeah, that definitely was something I wasn't familiar with. I thought that, oh yeah, the Guard is going to have all the experience in this area. Do you think that there's a, if some company, and you know, a big part of what I've heard uh, this effort is is about with this National Cyber Whatever Center, is to have small companies that don't have the capability for cyber because they don't have a big whole IT department that, that does that or whatever, um, to have somewhere to turn to and if all else fails almost. Um, right. But that might be as a one-off. It's not going to be a declaring emergency from the governor. Um, sure. You know, they come rolling into the, the, the NCIC and uh, is there something that you might do as an advisory role to help out with you know, from experience wise or what's the what's the thoughts there? What's your limitations, I guess I would say? You know, we're more limited after an event. Mm -hmm. You know, if an event were to happen through the statutory ability to advise them after an event. What we really prefer to do is to have them come and participate in an exercise or participate in some training prior to the event uh, we have some more flexibility there we uh, um, we could certainly you know through the course of an exercise that a small company might participate in our folks can look at what they have and say you know it looks like you may have vulnerabilities here but you look pretty solid here mm -hmm. so that's easier prior to the event but once an event has occurred uh, if it doesn't reach that scale of a of a governor's declaration it's it's we're pretty limited on how we can help them yeah and i think that the center the center that uh, the governor's building actually fills a niche there that, mm -hmm. that we don't fill uh, that the as they work through their idea of their response center uh, i think that these small companies may be able to go to the the center whatever it ends up being called and get help mm -hmm. that it may not come from the national guard but i do think that that that's one of the governor's objective is that that some asset is available to these smaller, not Fortune 500 companies. Yeah. So tell us about the things they can get involved with before. Lay down the plan of what's going to be available, what what you currently have available, and w you know, if I'm a company, small business owner listening to this, and I want to pre-prepare and get on this this training list and everything, what is it that I would do? Right. Uh, you know, we do two pretty large-scale exercises every year uh, in, in coordination with the state of Colorado. And uh, I think if, uh, if a, 
you know, I don't, I don't think any company would be turned down if they were to call and say, hey, can I uh, have my cyber guys either participate in this exercise or come observe this exercise or just be there and learn something. Um, I think you could enter, you know, the exercise. I think the threshold's pretty low for getting, for getting in on an exercise. Uh, how do you do that? Uh, I think there's a couple of ways. Um, you can, you can call the the uh, Colorado's Office of Information Technology, and you know they have the schedule. Uh, you can call us. In fact, you could call me, and I would. Uh, 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 help organize your your entry into that because we really do these partnerships are important uh, anything we can do to to minimize an event mm -hmm. that's that's time well spent um, but we do them typically in May and again in August mm -hmm. so those are kind of the major exercises what was the first time you, you said what was the in, first May May right May and August yeah. okay and how long of a time would they need to get a hold of you beforehand to be involved you know, it would depend on their what how involved they wanted to be. So, mm -hmm. if they wanted to be an exercise participant, probably four to six months. Okay. Uh, so that we we have the opportunity to understand their objectives, what they want to get out of the exercise, and 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 see if that's a fit. Mm -hmm. If they just want to come and do some over the shoulder observing, you know, a couple of weeks is probably okay. Okay. Uh, so, and what would that involve? Hooking your networks up together so you have access into what they're doing it can companies are sometimes reluctant to do that and they have a you know they have reason to be mm -hmm. um, in the exercise typically we establish a stand for the exercises we, we establish a standalone network to reduce risk of anything you know because we're going to intentionally uh, try to infect the network so so we create this kind of isolated training environment mm -hmm. Um, and so, a company could put their their systems into that uh, that isolated network if they wanted to, and really do a a pretty thorough test of their uh, of their network. Mm -hmm. They may not want to do that, and they may want to, you know, dial it back a little bit, um, mm -hmm. and that's okay too. Uh, in they can take it all the way back to. Uh, somewhere in the middle, which is, hey, we'll get on your stuff on the network and, and we'll just practice identifying okay. uh, vulnerabilities, identifying threats, um, and practice some of our our procedural responses. Uh, and then they can dial it all the way back to, we're just going to sit in a chair behind you and, and observe mm -hmm. and try to pick up things. So, so I think, you, you know, and that's why it takes, if they want to be in the exercise, in the network, it takes a while to configure the network in a way to bring in what they are willing to bring in. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, they have a lot, sometimes they have proprietary things that they want to protect and that makes a lot of sense to us. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, you know, the participants willingness to, uh, to go all in or just be an observer varies based okay. on their own criteria. So what if we're talking about the small business that has one IT guy and doesn't really have any cyber expertise? Um, is this a, a good opportunity to just learn and watch? and Or do you have training for that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah I think, you know, for, uh, for a company like that, that's a great opportunity for them to just kind of do some over-the-shoulder stuff. So we learn stuff from them, I'm sure. Uh, every time we do it, our guys walk away yeah. saying... Uh, that they learn something, so we're happy to have them. Okay, well that's uh, that's good to hear. So we had talked a little bit before we, we started about uh, you know information security, critical infrastructure. Um, the the larger world of cybersecurity really includes so many more things than data security. Um, you know we talked a little bit before we started about the difference between information security, data security and then really kind of critical infrastructure and other business models that are more reliant on either physical security, real-time communications availability, or right. factory automation around Colorado. A lot of advanced manufacturing's looking for solutions in cyber that's not really following the flow of information security and data that runs a company. What kind of a, of a focus or practice do you do in those areas to help build the cyber in those other side of the house, we'll say? 
Yeah. Yeah, I think you're asking about, you know, how do we help a, a company protect their ICS or their SCADA? Um, as we just recently were working with a, uh, a privately held uh, power consortium. Mm-hmm. You know, they have all kinds of SCADA uh, and ICS equipment that, to, that we, and we it's, a, it's a new partnership, so we were just exploring, you know, another set of eyes how much are they comfortable letting our guys look at and what can our guys maybe see that their guys didn't see they have a pretty good team you know Mm -hmm. quite a bit of talent already on board it was just looking for you know another set of eyes to say hey you know did we miss something or not uh and so we do that's that's actually an important part of our our role i think because again this gets to protecting the critical infrastructure um and so this company was interested in having us look at that kind of those physical pieces that are controlled by ICS and, and how do you protect those or at least how do you identify if, uh, if a threat has gotten in. You know, a threat could be embedded months or, or before they, uh, they or go even off. In, even in supply chains could come there. From Absolutely. The, when you got yeah. the equipment. Yeah. Or backdoors yeah. into it. So, you know, and, and I'm hearing the, kind of the same thing that, you know, we – really run into everywhere is that side of cyber is not as well defined as, yeah um, yeah definitely could you know use. what is what is cyber security yeah you know what is that and people very intelligent people define it differently you know that's uh, a good that's a good question i usually ask that right up front what <laughs> is your definition of cyber security yeah you know i think uh you know, the the Army always tries to define things, so they came out with like a seven-paragraph definition of cybersecurity. Oh, boy. Uh, but really, I think what we're talking about is, you know, all the efforts to to ensure freedom from threats to security, uh, to ensure integrity and access to it, both information, systems, and networks, and really preserve uh, our ability to legally operate in the cyber domain, that to me is what cybersecurity boils down to. Mm-hmm. Um, so we know, can get, operate, but the people that aren't supposed to can't. Right. In the in the virtual right. environment, in the digital world. In, in this in the virtual environment, the, the the people who are supposed to be operating in it are operating in it and doing so legally, doing yeah. so in a way that they should be uh, to allow access. Uh, to to information, to systems, to networks, and ultimately to to the products and services that are provided. Yeah. Uh, but boy, you'll find uh, some very intelligent people say, "Well, that was a terrible definition. Here's mine," and, and that's okay. And I hear a lot of you. You have the operational definition. We're trying to keep things operational. Um, what do you feel about you know what needs to be in place for the future? Of to enable you to continue operations, what kind of de- behind-the-scenes design work, maybe even what big changes? Well, that's a tough question too. Um, y- y- I think that's important. You know, design changes. We improve uh, systems uh, that that defend networks, defend ICS, defend SCADA. Um, but that's only part of the equation, right? Um, because every time we do that, uh, the threat's going to, they're, they're adaptable, uh, they're bright, they're going to figure out another way. I think it really is going to come down to people. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, it's going to come down to, uh, have we invested uh, in training people uh, in two respects? Uh, one, your general workforce. You know, your general workforce is your first line of defense. Right. Uh, you know how we all hate to reset our password, uh, but it's important. Uh, mm-hmm. You know how you teach your workforce. You know I don't know this to be a fact, but I understand that there were cashiers in Target that saw indicators long before uh, Target got in trouble. That if they had perhaps understood what they were seeing and known who to report it to. So there's this training of the general workforce to be vigilant, to be observant uh, in the cyber domain. Just the same as it was the same idea as you know, locking the front door uh, of the office when you go home at night. Well, do you log off? What do you take appropriate security measures for your systems when you go home at night? So I think that's an important uh, piece of what we can do. 
and then the other pieces how do we you know how do we educate the young men and women coming now probably now in middle school uh through high school and then as they go on to pursue either a college degree or a trade school are we providing the right curriculum Mm -hmm. to train to train the next uh, cyber innovators, you know, the guys who are going to be doing the, the hard thinking. I'm not sure we're doing that quite right right now. Mm-hmm. And so I think that, but in my mind, Chris, it comes back in, in all cases to, you know, human capital, to people. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, than, I, I have a theory on that that uh, what's kind of missing right now is the ability to hold the actors accountable. That really what, what the focus uh, could benefit from is a, a switch to finding a way to hold the people who do act in the virtual environment accountable, and that gradually changes the actions of people. Instead of making everybody responsible for protecting themselves against a, a million possible entries into, in every direction, and let's just train everybody to know everything, people get overwhelmed. Sure, so, too much. You know, in, in a design of a system that would be more effective for cyber. That, that's kind of my approach in the theory is to design in trust and accountability in the virtual environment. Yeah, boy, accountability is uh, uh, is a key, but it's a tough, tough nut to crack, uh, especially if uh, the bad actors are maybe uh, uh, not in the United States. If they're mm-hmm. and, and what if they're a private citizen of a different country or what if they're a nation state? You yeah. know, and so I, I I totally agree that accountability, of course, is is important. But boy, that's a that's a difficult problem. Yeah. But I think what you know, if you think about where we are, you know, this is all pretty new. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the laws, the way our legislation, those things take time in our country. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sometimes a lot of time in our country, and and uh, I I think eventually we'll get to what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, certainly, we'll probably reach be, a point. That should be the end objective, and what we're heading towards is kind of what what you know my theory there is, I guess. Right. I found it interesting when the FBI and Apple uh, got into the uh, uh, the business over the iPhone that they were both citing a legislation from like the 1700s. Mm-hmm. Uh, I found that very interesting. Well, you know, that uh, makes sense to me, actually, because the last time we ran into this problem was in the 1700s when the whole world said piracy needs to go away. And we right, need to do we... something internationally to stop this because everybody's tired of it. And I think that's coming for uh, for the cyber domain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, there's too much at stake. Um, and uh, And... and the international community is not going to be able to walk away from it, not going to be able to, to ignore it because the cost is too high. So I yeah. think we'll get there. Yeah, I hear that. Well, kind of in closing, I wanted to uh, give you an opportunity to put out anything to listeners or to decision makers that might be helpful or that uh, the Colorado National Guard might want to make uh, you know, information available to everybody. You know, sure. I appreciate that, Chris. I, I would be remiss if I, uh, if I uh, didn't take the opportunity to, to say... Uh, it's a privilege to, to serve in, in Colorado's National Guard, to serve our neighbors, uh, and, uh, and invite uh, the bright young men and women of Colorado to look into us and maybe consider being a, a Colorado National Guardsman. We, we're always looking for talent, and so uh, if any of your listeners are, are interested, please, uh, you can Google us and get right to a page about more information about the National Guard and we would love to have there's lots of lots of talented young men and women that we'd love to have on the team uh, so I wouldn't want to miss the opportunity to invite them to, to check us out definitely all right well thanks a lot for joining today Michael and uh, it's been a pleasure on my end for sure well Curtis thank you for having me it's been great I've really enjoyed this all right have a great day you too we hope you have enjoyed this episode of New Cyber Frontier. Remember to get involved. Often we think that someone else will handle privacy and security in the virtual world, but you are the only one truly in command of your virtual fate. Join our mailing list so we can keep you informed of breaking news and new releases. If you have an idea, 
If you have a question that you would like to hear answered, or if you want to get involved with our efforts, reach out to us at newcyberfrontier.com. We also encourage you to visit our sponsors' links as they are the ones that really make this show possible. I want to thank each of you for supporting the show, and we look forward to seeing you back for the next episode of New Cyber Frontier.